Welcome to our Wednesday Night Live. I'm Michael Harbridge, and tonight we're going to be working on leaves. I'm going to show you how to make dimensional leaves like I used on this owl. Um, I'm going to show you how to do impressions in flat pieces like this bowl. Um, and we're going to do the coloring, and I'm going to show you guys how to do the coloring on these leaves as well. You can do this with clay puzzling techniques doing the leaves. Um, and you can also make dimensional leaves for things like trees. I'm going to hold this, this tree up. This is one of my, my favorite pieces, um, doing this for like fall trees, or you can do them in greens and different colors as well. Um, we've got some poinsettia leaves coming out that you'll be able to use for doing poinsettia trees. That's one of the projects we have coming up. So we're going to give just a couple minutes. I see we got quite a few people have made it into the room. And um, if you are interested in a mystery box, I see a lot of people are already saying mystery box, mystery box. If you're not familiar with the mystery box, what that is, is a medium flat rate shipping box. And I don't tell you what's in this box, um, but we will draw one of the names out tonight. So during the first 10 minutes of the live, we're going to have, um, got some stuff popping up on my screen here. Um, we will have um, a drawing from those names. So the, the first 10 minutes, we allow people to put their name in for mystery box. And when we draw for that, whatever name we draw, they get the option to purchase this box for $50. That includes shipping anywhere in the USA. Um, if you're international, um, you can get the box for $50, plus there would be some additional shipping on that, and we would work that out with you. Um, you won't know though what's in the box. And the hint that I'm going to give you guys is it has pretty much everything to do with what we're doing tonight. So that might give you an idea of what's in the box. Um, if we draw somebody's name and they decide, I already have what's in that box or I don't need the items that are in that box, um, we'll just draw another name until we have somebody that, that does want that box. So first 10 minutes, we're going to allow people to put their name in for the mystery box drawing. And um, it looks like we've got a, a good group here. I got to click. There's all kinds of stuff popping up on my screen here with, with Facebook, and it has taken my there. Okay, my video's back. I can see myself on there. Um, it's always good to be able to see to make sure that that I have stuff in the screen that that I'm showing you. So let's get started. I'm going to flip the camera down, and I'm going to talk to you guys. Um, first, we're going to do a little bit with the color. And this bowl is a really good example of a really easy technique to do. This is just done on a slab of clay. And um, we just press the leaves in there. And I use a bisque plate for a form. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. What I want to do first, though, is I'm going to set this aside. And I've got just a, a simple slab of clay that I did some leaf impressions in that I'm going to show you guys the technique of painting. So I'm going to do the wash on here, and while that dries, I'm going to show you how to do the impressions and things with the leaves, and then do um, the color in here. So it should be a, a pretty quick and easy night tonight. Um, I'm going to be working with Mako Stroke and Coat. If you've got Duncan Concepts, if you've got um, Gare's Fun Strokes, um, they will work with this. You can do really the same technique. We'll work with um, one stroke under glazes as well. Um, but I'm going to be working with, with stroke. And the first color that we're going to work with is tuxedo. And this technique can be done. This is just a piece of low fire earthenware bisque. This piece happens to be stoneware. Um, this technique will work on all different clay bodies. Stroke and coat has a, a nice firing range. Usually on the label, it will say, I'm going to hold this up to the camera here, get it to focus mid-range firing results, and then the, the tuxedo, the black, has no change. And so if you're worried that the colors might change when you're going to a mid-fire temperature or um, something hotter than like an 06 firing, um, usually that will let you know. Um, and, and usually they do like a cone 5, cone 6. Um, if it, I'm just looking at some of the other labels here. Um, like the SC6, it says mid-range color results slightly lightens. So some of the colors do change a little bit when you um, 
for them to hotter temperatures, but they really, even the reds and stuff really come out well on there. So what I've done is I've put a little bit of the, the tuxedo black in a cup, and I've got a bowl of water here with a sponge, and I'm just going to take it, I'm going to dilute this black with about two parts water to one part color. I'm going to use a stiffer bristled fan brush here, and I'm just kind of using that to mix it up, and then I'm going to apply a coat of this over the top of my design with the black. And I want to kind of get it to puddle in the crevices and get everything coated. You can use the color straight, <clears throat> um, but a lot of times getting into the down into the texture of the leaf impressions and things, um, it doesn't work as well as it does when it's diluted. And we're actually going to wipe most of this off, so it's not really necessary to paint everything around here. However, on this bowl, because I had a texture in the background, I did the black over the whole thing and then wiped it back with a sponge. And so these light areas that you see are the buff color of the stoneware clay body that I used on here, and the black just catches in the texture. But what we mainly want is we want that color to stay down in the crevices and the veining on our leaf designs. So that usually dries pretty fast. Um, and you can do this again. You can do this part of the technique with Duncan Easy Strokes. You can even use Designer Liner. You can use um, the color concentrates from, from Colors for Earth. They'll all work for the same technique. And I'm going to take a clean sponge, and I'm going to wipe this back, and I'm just turning the sponge periodically to kind of a clean area so that I can wipe the color back. And I want it to stay down in the crevices because this is going to make for a lot of the shading on our leaves. We're going to be working with stroke and coat on top of what we just did with this wash on here. And the nice thing with that product or a product like Concepts and um, Fun Strokes is they're translucent. If you only do one or two coats of that color, on top, so the black that we have on here will show through. So this is basically what I'm looking for, and this actually by itself is kind of neat. If you're looking for just a black and white design, um, doing a wash like this on there, and then clear glazing it, um, you could do some speckling on here. Um, we'll do a little bit of speckling at the end tonight on this, and that would be a cool design all by itself. But if you want to add the color, we can add fall colors, we can add greens and things in here. So I'm going to show you some of the different methods. But I want this to dry for a couple of minutes, so I'm going to set this aside, get my big bowl out of the way here, and I'm going to show you guys how to use the leaves for making dimensional leaves and making impressions in clay. So there's lots of different leaves. There's oak leaves, there's mum leaves, there's lemon leaves, which we call traditional. There's uh, maple leaves, there's dahlia, there are hydrangea, um, and there are lots of big leaf designs as well, going all the way up to, like this one is the large rhubarb leaf. Um, I did this one in a live a while back, um, probably back in November, December, I think, showing how to do clay leaf bowls using these big forms. Um, but you can make um, really cool stuff with all of these forms. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of leaves here, and I'm going to pick out these three and just set the rest aside for now. And the reason I picked these three out is they each have kind of unique characteristics. Um, the maple leaves, there's a set of three of these leaves, and these work great for doing impressions. I used these in this vase, and this was a clay puzzling technique um, that I did where I placed the leaves in the mold and then pressed the clay on top of it. And when I took it out of the mold, then the leaf was stuck in the clay, and I just peeled that away after it came out of the mold. Um, it works great for doing impressions, but to make dimensional leaves, you can do it with this, but it gets really fragile because these are so narrow in these areas that when you try to peel them away, sometimes they want to rip apart there, um, and it's hard sometimes to clean the clay out in between to get a nice smooth edge on the leaf. So that's the only one that I usually avoid using dimensional leaves, but they're great for doing impressions. And this is the mum leaves on here, more of the maple. I guess I just did maple and mum on this particular piece. 
All right, let me set that aside now. So um, this one I'm going to save for impressions, so I'm going to set that aside. And most of the leaves come in a, a variety of different sizes. I just grabbed a handful of my leaves, but you can see there's different mum size leaves. Um, from small to large, there's usually three to four of each leaf design. So we'll start out with doing dimensional leaves. And those can be used, I showed the owl at the beginning. I'll lift him back up here. So this would be doing leaves like this that are going to be added onto a piece, not just doing an impression. Um, so this is what I'm going to show you. And this happens to be the hydrangea leaves that were used for the wings on this large owl. Um, the little mum leaves and one of the do or a couple of the dahlia leaves were used up on the head of the owl. And if you guys have questions as we're going, feel free to, to type those in there. Janine is frantically trying to get all of the mystery box people and we're at that 10 minute mark now and I see she stopped writing. So um, if you haven't already put mystery box in there. Um, we're cutting off the ability to do that. She's got everybody's names and now she's going to start watching for questions that you guys have as we're going. So I'm just going to work with um, low fire. Someone wants to know how you are tonight. What's that? Someone wants to know how you are tonight. I'm wonderful tonight. <clears throat> the weather's really crummy here though. It's been on and off kind of rainy and stormy today and lots of thunder and we have a couple dogs that are neurotic so it's been <laughs> a little challenging. Someone said that it's really loud even with turning down the volume loud and scratchy. I don't know if you can turn down your microphone. Um, let me look here. Are other people experiencing that? Some that people it's, did comment. Okay. It, yeah. um, I'll just talk a little bit softer. Is that better? <laughs> Do you have the flower petals that match the flower leaves? Flower petals that match the flower leaves. Like if it's a... Oh, um, no, we don't have... I don't have flower forms to go with the leaves. No, that's a good question. Nope, we just have the, the leaf forms. So to make a dimensional leaf, I'm flattening out a piece of clay just with my fingers here. I'm trying to sit back a little further from the microphone so I'm not blasting anybody. Um, I'm just flattening this out with my fingers. And a common mistake that people make with this is they try to get um, to, um, you know what, close the bathroom door. They might be hearing the sound of the air conditioning, the vent. Sometimes that it actually picks up sounds like that, More and that might be. <laughs> sound is fuzzy. I, I don't, I don't, sound is fuzzy. Yeah, I'm not sure with the sound. I the The microphone is like, five inches in front of my mouth here, so I'm not sure. Audio is the sort, yeah, I haven't, I haven't changed anything, so I'm not sure what, just sounds a bit staticky here. Hmm. All right. Well, um, anyway, so I'm flattening the clay out, and you don't want to get it too thin. A lot of people make the mistake of um, the clay, they want to make their leaf thin, so they make their slab of clay really thin. And you don't want to go too thin with that because what will happen when you make your leaf and you try to peel it off of the rubber form, it just rips and tears and it doesn't um, come off very well. So um, make it about just under a quarter of an inch thick. Um, and then I'm going to take the leaf and I'm going to press it into that clay. So I'm going to make my way around and press the leaf down into the clay and I'm going to tear away the excess clay. So I'm just kind of pulling this up and tearing that away. But now what I've got is this really thick clunky looking leaf. And while I want the main part of the leaf to be thick, the edge of it I want to be thin so it gives the illusion that it's a nice thin leaf. Because if I just peel this off, it's, it's really thick and it's clunky. And I see people that do that or they roll out a slab of clay and they cut around it and then they lift their leaf up and they've got this leaf that's, you know, a half an inch thick. So what I do is I then take my thumb and I bevel this edge. So from the top, I'm taking my thumb and I'm kind of pinching down and just beveling that edge a little bit so that it's thin just along the edge. And I'll just continue to go along and I'm tearing off a little bit of clay. 
I'm going to leave the clay usually thicker at the very bottom and I'll explain that in a minute. So I'm going to go around both sides leaving it thicker at the bottom and I want to leave it thick in the middle. So the leaf in the middle is thick but on the edge it's kind of tapered off. The reason I leave it thick on the end is so that I can easily grab this and peel this apart. If I bevel this end down here and I make it real thin at the end, it makes it really difficult to get that clay to pull away on the leaf. And in most cases, this leaf is going to be added on to something and you'll have something overlapping. So even though this end is thick, when I press this onto like the tree forms or the wing on the owl, um, I actually take that, that wing and I just go like this and I squish this right into the main part of the clay where I'm adding that on. So it ends up smoothing out that area anyway. And so you, it, you want it thick there to be able to release it from, from that form. And then you can take those leaves and you can bend them any way that you want. Now you can use them like I showed on the owl. You can also use them on things like the pumpkins. This is all mum leaves that I used on the top of this pumpkin. Um, and so these leaves, I don't add them on. I usually just take, and if I've got my pumpkin sitting there, I'll kind of take the leaves and kind of bend these a little bit and just set them aside so they dry so that they kind of come up and, and have, you know, not just flat. I kind of give them a little bend and a twist and make each one a little bit different so that they don't sit real flat on the pumpkin. I don't usually add these on before I fire the piece on the piece like this because it's a lot easier to paint the pumpkin, paint the leaves separate, and then glue them on and masking tape them in place till the glue dries, peel the tape away, and you've got your leaves stuck on that piece. Um, For added strength, would a paper clay work? Yeah, paper clay will work. I have worked with paper clay as well. Um, and I was surprised because I thought the first time I worked with paper clay that I would have um, issues with like the paper not like making the clay too stiff that it wouldn't pick up the textures, but that it's basically like tissue paper, toilet paper is my understanding that's in um, paper clay. And so it's very soft and you can't tell, like when you rip it apart, you can hardly tell the paper clay that there's any paper in that clay. So yeah, they, the paper clay works really well and paper clay, when you add two parts together, it works really well for adding parts together. What clay do you use? This is the one that I'm working with here is just mm -hmm. continental clay happens to be one of the closest clay suppliers and I'm, I'm good friends with the owners. And so um, this is their low fire white. But like I said, you can use mid range high fire clay to do this technique as well. So now I've just done um, a little slab of clay here and I just flatten this out by hand. Normally I would run this through like the slab roller or um, use a rolling pin and I would make, you know, a large slab of clay like this. And a lot of times I do just rough edges on these bowls. I don't sit there and cut it and smooth these edges. There are textures and bumps and things where the clay kind of rips as you lift it up. And, and with the leaves, it makes it very organic and very natural looking. So I'm just doing kind of a small slab of clay here. And then um, there's a couple different ways that I can do this. I can take and press the leaves into the surface and then drape this in a bowl. Or I can drape the clay in the bowl and then press the leaves in. Either way will work. I'm just going to do this one to show you the technique on here. Um, and so when you just use your fingers to press the clay or the leaves into the clay, you end up getting lots of fingerprints and things around there. And, and you could sit there with a rib or your finger and you could work on smoothing this really well. What I like to do is just take a washcloth or a towel and I kind of wad that up and I take and I press that over the top. And this adds, and I'll lift this up to the camera in a minute, this adds some really neat texture in the background and it gets rid of all those fingerprints and things as you press over the top 
of the leaves. I can go around the edge and add that texture around the edge as well. You can see that in the clay, all of that cool texture that's in the background. Now I would take this then and I would drape this into a bowl and I've got a little bit bigger bowl than I need here, but you'll get the general idea. Um, this is just an earthenware bisque bowl and I can take and drape this in there to use as my form. Now if I had a larger slab of clay, sometimes this clay will go up over the edge of the bowl and I'll kind of lift the edges and it droops down in and goes over the other side. Um, if I want to have texture on the back side of that slab, instead of a smooth background, I can take a towel and I can place that inside the mold and then press my clay into there. And again, using the washcloth, I can press over the top of this. And as I put the pressure on that clay, I'm adding the texture to the top. And if I press it hard enough, I'll pick up the texture on the back side as well. Can you hold the bowl on its side so they can see the depth? Yeah, and then any depth will, will work for this. But this one is, I'll, I'll hold it up once I take this out of here. The other advantage to using a towel in there, not only does it add texture to the backside of your clay, but it makes it really easy to go like this and lift your piece right out of there so that you can use the form on another piece. So you can see the, the texture on the backside of the clay as well as the front side of the clay. So this one just happens to be kind of a shallow bowl. It's probably a couple inches deep. I like bowls that have lips on them. Um, a lot of times um, I'll buy big bowls from rummage sales, from uh, Hobby Lobby sometimes. They have all that finished wear in there. And I'll find some really ugly bowls that have really ugly designs on them. But the, um, the uh, I see somebody said the other bowl, oh, Luann's okay. asking. So this, is, this was done in like more of a, a deep spaghetti bowl type of thing. So it, it was a nice round, you can kind of see where the bowl was. It was a nice round bowl. So really any shapes. What you want to be careful of is that you don't have the clay going over the edge like this, over the edge of the bowl, because as this dries, it's going to shrink and it's going to want to catch there and there's a good chance this will break off. So anytime you come over the edge, you want to make sure that that is lifted up so that it's not going over. And sometimes I'll put a lot of clay underneath here to prevent it from falling off the edge or a sponge or some paper towel or wadded up newspaper so that it doesn't wrap around the edge. So anyway, I was saying like bowls and stuff that I get at Hobby Lobby or at rummage sales, they're usually glazed, they're not bisque. The nice thing about bisque is it absorbs moisture and you can put the, the clay right on there and it will absorb the moisture, it will dry, the piece can stay on there. Um, but if it's glazed or it's a glass bowl or a plastic bowl or something shiny, then I put the towel on those bowls as well. So really any forms you can use, any glazed shiny glass surfaces you can use. Now once I've got my, my clay in there, then I can go and I can lift the leaves out and just gently pull them away. And um, you can use like a needle tool or I'm going to use a, a brush handle here to pick up the edges of these leaves. And you just want to kind of gently lift them out. You don't want to just yank them out because sometimes there's a little bit of clay that wants to rip out with it. So be gentle when you do this. Get this last leaf pulled out. And I've got my leaf impressions in my clay. <clears throat> so the level on the microphone, I don't control you don't have, like, any of those. There's, no, you? there's a volume for my speakers, but there's no volume Some for. Say it was better after you lowered your I'm microphone. I'm turning the speaker I'm turning the speaker off. I've mm -hmm. turned the speaker off. I don't know if that makes any difference. Mm -hmm. There's um, closed captioning if you want to turn your. Yeah, there is closed <laughs> captioning. Yeah. But yeah, um, we can't figure out what to do to. Yeah, I think I just have to remember to talk softer. I'm so used to working in a group of people and having to talk loud, and most people are like, I can't hear you. Yeah, and we haven't had this problem before, and we haven't changed anything. So sorry, you guys, if it's a little loud. And, <laughs> His voice um, is just blowing you out. 
Yeah. So that's the basic technique for doing impressions, basic technique for making dimensional leaves. Um, now we're going to go back to our piece here and I'm show you guys how to do the color. So um, the fall colors, you can really use any colors that you want. Um, I like to use the Sunkist, the SC6 I like as a nice yellow. Um, orange Appeal SC75, nice bright orange for fall colors. Maybe that helps. So yeah, hot about. tamale. Who doesn't love hot tamale? It's a nice bright red. And we're going to throw in a little green. I've got some green thumb SC26. And we're going to do a little brown. We're going to do some java bean SC14. And I had an art teacher in high school that always said, and I think it was just her favorite color was purple, but she said everything that you do in art should have a little bit of purple. So I've got a little bit of Fruit of the Vine, okay. SC33. No, it was actually Sister Doris. I went mm -hmm. to a Catholic high school. I was a really good boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, so Sister Doris always said, and I had her for art appreciation freshman year, and she said, you know, you should always have some purple in there. And I've kind of, and it, it may sound weird to put a little purple in the leaves, but I'll show you, I think on some of these, I've got some purple that you can actually, yeah, I see can some. Can you see the name of the black again, please? Black is Tuxedo. <laughs> That's um, SC15, yeah. So if you look at this leaf right here, this is Fruit of the Vine, Hot Tamale, Green Thumb, Sunkissed, Orange Appeal, um, there's a little bit of the java bean in that leaf as well. So um, in this technique, it's so easy with the leaves. So you've got your black on that has dried. Um, and you have to remember that any time you brush over the top of a color of stroke and code or easy stroke or concepts or fun strokes, if they're not fired on, they can soften when they get wet. So you want to be careful that you don't overbrush on there when you start doing your your color technique so i usually start out with my lighter color and it doesn't it doesn't really matter but i'll start out and pick one area and i'll brush a little bit of the yellow and i brush this out i don't brush it on heavy so it should look really translucent and we're just going to use one coat and before that gets completely dry i dip the same brush into orange and then i'm going to go a little ways away from that yellow and i'm going to brush the orange and kind of overlap and drag that into the yellow and kind of blend it wet into wet. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to pick up a little bit of my red, my hot tamale, and I'm going to do the same thing. Start out away from the orange and go back and drag that over the top. So I'm still seeing the black through on these pieces. I'm going to add a little bit of green up in this area, blend it into the yellow. You don't need a lot of color. This isn't dry brushing. This is just brushing one coat on the surface. I'm going to add a little bit of brown. And by kind of overlapping the previous color, and now a little bit of the fruit of the vine, um, if you do it while it's still kind of wet, you get a little bit of a blend of the color. If the color gets too dry and you think, oh, I've got a really defined line there, you can just dip into a little bit of water on the brush and go over those areas and blend those colors together. So that's it for that leaf for now. Now, if I want to go with leaves that are more, you know, springtime leaves or, or summer leaves, I can go with some SC27 Sour Apple. And I'll go with a little bit darker green. I'm going to go with some Irish Luck, which is SC36. And I'm going to do basically the same thing. So on this oak leaf, I'm going to start out with some yellow. And, and it doesn't matter where you start on the leaf. On this one, I started on the tip. I can start on the side of this one if I want. And I'm going to apply some of the yellow. I'm going to go to the sour apple. And I'm not washing the brush out either because these colors are blending together. So it's not super important 
that I have, and I'm going to some of the green thumb that I had put out for the other leaf. It's not important that I wash the brush out because this is a blend of greens. On the other one, we had a blend of oranges and reds and yellow and brown and purple. We'll do a little bit of the darker green. Now this dark green, look at how intense that is on there. This one then I just kind of go and I brush over while it's still wet and kind of blend it into those lighter greens. And then I can go back into the light green overlap that over the top. What you don't want to do, you guys, is get the color so thick or the equivalent of three coats on there because if you get that color on too thick, it's going to block out your black underneath. Remember, three coats of a product like Stroke & Coat, Concepts, Fun Strokes, will give you solid coverage. So you don't want to put the equivalent of three coats on these leaves. It's basically one coat just kind of blending wet into wet. And so green leaves, I have a little bit of brown on that leaf. I wouldn't have to. I could do some areas of yellow on that leaf. So I know maple leaves aren't usually these colors, but I'm going to go with a little bit of yellow on this one. And then I'll go into the light green, the um, sour apple, and brush that into the yellow. And I'll go into some green thumb. Do you have a second to kind of explain the international shipping policy? So, so yeah, international shipping. Um, we ask if you ship that way. Our website, <laughs> our website does calculate for Canada. Um, we had it calculating for other countries as well. And because we have to pack stuff so much better to go international, um, because if stuff gets broken domestically, we can ship a new one out and it doesn't cost us that much for shipping. Average shipping on a package is about $15 in the U.S. And the average packing for a package going to the U.K., for example, is $250. And so we want to make sure that those things arrive in one piece and that we don't have breakage. So we end up going with much bigger boxes, a lot more packing material, um, and it ends up costing us more than what our, because our website is set up to calculate um, by the, the dimensions that we put in for the items. So, you know, a bottle of stroke and coat is put in our website and the measurement of this is, I'm going to say eight inches by three inches by three inches and it weighs one pound. Um, when we have to pack that for international, international, um, we have to put a lot of extra packing around. And so instead of like eight inches by eight inches by th or three, three inches by eight inches by three inches, it's more like 10 inches by six inches by six inches. And it ends up costing a lot more than what the website calculates. So if you're international and there's stuff that you want, just send us a message through the website, um, just listing the items that you're interested in and then your address. And we'll do an actual freight quote based on how big the package needs to be to ship that internationally. We haven't figured out a way yet to get our website to calculate different for international um, versus the U.S. At this point, we have to do um, a whole different website for international, which is not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so eventually we may figure that out. But that's the best way to do it is just send me a message and we'll try to get you a quote on it. So um, someone wants to know where the purple is. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're right. Yeah, Sister Doris is is frowning right now, so I'm gonna put a little bit of purple on the tip here. You know, and this is basically now I've put about the equivalent of two coats on there, but because I'm kind of brushing it out on there, I've probably got the equivalent of about one coat on here. It's when you start completely blocking out everything. Um, when the colors dry, they get real chalky and they do tend to black out everything below. There are some areas of the black showing here where I actually didn't scrub color down in. Um, so don't be alarmed after it dries that you can't see the black. But if when you're brushing it on doing that leaf, if you can't see any black under it, you're probably putting it on a little bit too thick. So Mariana Chow just wants leaves. It shouldn't be too bad, right? So no, and so, your yeah, and, and if it's like the small leaves, these can go into a 
um, flat rate package that in the U.S. costs about $8 to ship. And I don't remember where she is from. I recognize the name. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, might be, it might be $30 going somewhere international. So, yeah, that, those leaves shouldn't be bad. It's when we get into the clay puzzling molds that those really have to be packed well and it gets really costly um, to do. So now I've got the um, color on and I can do speckling or splattering. And I like to use one stroke underglazes. So things like Duncan Easy Strokes or Color Concentrates from Colors for Earth, um, either of these will work. And what's nice about these is they're super concentrated and they're basically pigment. There's no frit in this product. And so um, I can take and I can thin this down and I've got a stiffer bristled fan brush here. And I'm gonna take and I'm gonna dilute this a little bit and just get a little bit of color in my brush. I don't want it dripping with color. And I'm gonna flick the bristles. So my finger is gonna go from the bottom of the bristle. It's gonna go like this and the bristles will flick back toward the piece. So I'm going from the bottom, I'm bringing my finger up, and I let that flick back to the surface. You might have just answered this, and I actually wasn't listening either, but, um, and this person lost you for a bit, will the, but will the black come through better once it's fired? Is yes, it? yeah, because okay. I, I said as it dries, the chalkiness kind of covers it, and, and you might think, oh, but when you're actually painting it and the color's wet, that's when, pay attention, if you're not seeing any of the black showing through when it's wet, then you're getting it too heavy. Once it dries, yeah, you're not going to see much of the black showing through on there. <clears throat> so you can add the speckling. Now, if you're concerned that you may be have been a little heavy on the color, you can, or that you didn't leave enough color in there for the veining to show through, you can go back with a liner brush and you can add some veining. And so I can go back and I can run a vein down the middle and I can run some of these main veins back in the piece if I'm worried about that. And I'm going to show you an example of a piece that I did where I didn't do enough black in my wash. And I'll show you the difference between the leaves on those two pieces. Can you say what you were thinking? So that was either like Duncan Easy Strokes or Colors for Earth Color Concentrates. And it's the black that I used using a stiff bristled brush that stiffer bristle versus a real soft bristle. This is hard bristle. This will flick back. Some people will use a toothbrush. Um, there are actual splatter brushes out there, but most people have some type of a firm fan brush that they can use. So this tree, I didn't leave, th this tree actually, you know what, this one, now that I look at it closer, instead of using black for my wash on this, I used dark brown. And I wanted to see how well the veining and the leaves came out. And this tree to me looks really pale in comparison to this tree, which weighs about 100 pounds. Okay. And this one, I went back and I added black veining because I wanted it to be very, very defined on those leaves. Um, on these other pieces, let me pick these back up here. So the, the, the amount of black that I left on this piece tonight was similar to what I did on this bowl. In this one, um, I got really nice black showing through in the veins. On this vase, I got really nice black showing through as well. So it's up to you if you want to go back and add some main veins in there to, to make them a little bit deeper and darker, you can. And I recommend using a liner brush I'm going to show you guys tonight. These are some new, they're not really new, they're new to our website. These are fabulous fine point liners and these have this really thick belly, they're natural hair, and they have this, what I call kind of a rat's tail on it. And this brush holds so much color. 
And I forgot to have a piece of paper out here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take this piece of bisque, and I'm just going to load this brush up and show you, because that belly holds so much color that you can do. Right here, I'll do it on the back of my... <laughs> Once this brush is loaded, you can really do a lot of lines. And this is on bisque, so this is absorbing the color. But look at how this is still going and going and going with color. I could keep going. And that's the, the nice thing with this belly on here. And then this long tail, it really gives you nice fine lines but holds a lot of color so you're not reloading the brush real frequently. It's also got an acrylic handle mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about it cracking and splitting. Um, it's got a rubber gripper for comfort and so people know where to hold the brush properly. It's a, it's a nice brush and it comes in a set of three and we just added these to our website today. So there's three different sizes. There's, I think it's a six, a four, six, and an eight. And they come in a set and they're on special for $15 for the set of those three those three brushes. For the um, flicking part, can mm -hmm. you use the stroke and coat tuxedo? That's a good question. Can you use the stroke and coat tuxedo to do the speckling? You can, but you need to thin the color. In order to get it so that it flicks off, you need to thin the color. And because stroke and coat is a fritted product, it basically has glass in it. Um, it's not as concentrated as things like the, the color concentrates or the easy strokes. So when you dilute it, your spots will be usually lighter. They may not be as intense or as dark as you'll get with, with the easy strokes or the color concentrates. And you'll notice like as you're splattering it on there, they'll look really diluted. So practice on some paper with it. Um, try to get to the right consistency. I probably do about half water, half color when I thin it. If you don't thin a product like Stroke and Coat and you try to speckle it on there, um, I'll, I'll actually just take some of this color that's out here and show you. So if I load this brush up and I can't have big globs of it in there and I go like this to flick it, I'm really not getting, even if I do this really hard, I see one little speck right here that went on the piece. So the color needs to be fluid in order to get it to release from the brush. Um, so um, it will work. The color just won't be as intense as you'll get with a with a one-stroke <laughs> underglaze. Any other questions? Can you see they go underglaze? Um, can you see Mako underglaze? Um, so Mako has... Um, oh, oh, sorry. Oh. Someone wanted to know what the name of that brush is. I think it was back to when you were doing the liner brushes. And okay. So the, 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 the brushes, I'll, I'll show all the different brushes. So the liner brushes... Well, maybe can you use Mako oh, underglaze? Mako underglaze. So, yeah, so I'll talk about the brushes sorry. and then I'll talk about the underglaze. So the liner brushes, these are the fabulous fine point liners. They're on our website, learnfiredarts.com. Um, under the events, under the live specials, and they're sold in a set of three for $15. The fan brush that I was using, that one is, it's the Moderna um, fan brush, and we sell this on the website. I'm pretty sure we sell this individually. I know it comes in the brush set, um, but I, th I think we have this individually as well. I'll double check that after the live tonight. Um, but this one is, is hog bristle. It's the stiffer bristle where a lot of times you're used to working with softer fan brushes for applying glaze. You want that stiffer hog bristle for that technique. And for the, the leaves, you can use a gold taclon bristle, a natural hair brush, any of those will work. The gold taclon is going to drag the color out a little bit more, where a soft natural hair brush is going to lay it on a little heavier. So if you use a soft brush, you may definitely want to go back and add a little bit of, of veining on those pieces. Um, and then what was the other question? I already forgot. Can you use Mako underglaze? Oh, so Mako underglaze. So Mako makes, um, there's a lot of confusion in the market. So they make a product called Fundamentals. Um, and they're Fundamental underglazes. And I've got some right here on the shelf. I'm going to grab one down to show you and explain the, the differences here. So... 
the fundamental underglazes, these are, and they come in two ounce bottles with screw on lids, and this is a pint bottle. These are clay based. So these are colored slip. So the white is basically w slip with white, a whitener in it to make it a, a whiter color than the slip would be. Um, your oranges, blues, and things. So these have clay in them. And if you dilute these, it's kind of like diluting stroke and coat, um, because you're basically diluting slip where things like the color concentrates and easy strokes are just pigment. There's no clay in this or the, the um, easy strokes. This has clay in it. And so this is what most people refer to as an underglaze. Now, sometimes in the market, they refer to products like stroke and coat and concepts as underglaze too. This is basically a fritted product. This basically has glass in it, ground glass, frit, to make it that this fires out shiny when you put three coats on. Fundamentals will fire out dull because it's basically colored slip that you're putting on there. Now, if I use this to do my colors on my leaves, this is slip. So think about if you take slip and you brush a coat of it on something, are you going to see stuff through it? Probably not. Now, the black with one coat of this on there might be powerful enough to kind of show through, but chances are anywhere that that puddles on that piece, it's going to block out what's under there, even with one coat. It's going to it's going to be more opaque than a product like Stroke and Coat is going to be. Duncan made a product. Um, their cover coats were the equivalent to this. Amico makes um, velvet underglazes. They make their um, UG underglazes. They're all some form of a clay-based product. Um, not recommended for this technique. That's a good question. Do you wait for the speed ball to dry in the mold and then press the clay into the leaf? Do you wait for the speed ball to dry? <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I'm going to check changes things. I'm going to go back. Sometimes when I actually... I mean, speed ball is a company that makes wheels and they make a line of color. Okay. So there, there could be something there that... Um, okay, I'm just scrolling back in the okay. questions here. Sorry. Do you can wait you... for the... the Okay, so the question, do you wait for the speed ball to dry in the mold and then press the clay into the leaf? I, I'm not sure what maybe, the speed ball word is supposed to be, but I... Can, yeah, and I, I think... In the meantime, there's another question about... So, um, yeah, so the leaves, when you put them inside the mold... From the next question, or are you looking at the next question? I'm, I'm going to kind okay. of address, yep, can you add the leaves to poured ceramic and fire... Um, together since the low fire clay or would it be together. better? Okay. You were answering together. So the leaf forms, if you're using a mold, a clay puzzling mold, and you're pressing the moist clay in the mold, this leaf is going to go inside the mold facing up, and then your clay is going to get pressed over the top of that in the mold. When you open the mold up, and you take your clay piece out, your leaves are going to be embedded in that piece when you open the mold up. And at that point, then you're going to smooth out any seam lines that are on there, and then you're going to pick the leaf out, and you're going to pull it out of all the way around the piece. But wait until you're done smoothing out any imperfections on there before you remove the leaves. Otherwise, you risk bumping where the leaf design is. As far as using them on a piece that's been poured, so if I take a piece out of the mold, and let's say, you know, this was... <clears throat> A greenware bowl. I'm going to flip it over the other way here. So this is a cast piece that I took out. If I take this leaf and I start pressing it into this and try to do that, I have to press really hard to get that impression and, and look what's happening to the clay as I press around. The clay is, is flexible when you take it out of the mold. You're probably going to have a hard time pressing this into it unless if it is a say a bowl or a plate, where you've got the support of the mold behind it, then if you've got that support, you could press those leaves into it. But if it's something like a vase, a vertical piece, if I cast a vase like this, and I tried to make these leaf impressions in there, you know, if I reached into the inside and could get my hand in there and put support behind it, I might be able to press that leaf in without deforming it too bad, but it would be a bit of a challenge to, to do that. And you can't really lay the leaves inside of a casting mold when you're pouring with slip because they'll just float around in the slip in there. I hope that answers those questions. Um, the, the first person, she said, 
I mean stroke and coat. Do you wait for the stroke and coat to dry in the mold and then press the clay into the leaf? That was kind of um, we're not putting the stroke and coat on. So the stroke and coat is going on after um, the piece has been fired. So you've got your clay piece. You've built your clay piece. You've either done a bowl and laid the leaves in and done your impressions, or you've done a mold and you've removed them. The piece is fired to 04, whether you're working with low fire pieces or mid range or high fire pieces. Um, you're going to do this. The coloring is all done on the bisque, not on the greenware. Okay. So there wouldn't be any color going into the molding part of the process. And, and you know what? Some people do use stroke and coat on clay, and you can do that, but it's really hard to do a wash and wipe it back like the black because your clay is soft and wants to dissolve when you get it wet. And so that's why I work on, on bisque. I also am a little nervous firing pieces in the kiln that are clay with glaze on them because, God forbid, that piece would pop in the kiln or blow up in the kiln that glaze would stick to everything in the kiln and could be very costly and, and damaging to other pieces in there as well as the kiln itself. So um, can you use Georgia's pigment? And then other another person said, so Georgie's wash would work maybe? I don't know. If that's the yeah, so Georgie's is a, a, a company out in um, Oregon, and they have, um, there's different dry pigments and things. A lot of pottery places sell dry pigments and you could yeah you could use those types of washes especially on um, mid-range pieces um, there's a lot of like oxides and copper washes mako also makes copper washes amico makes um, copper and there's i can't even think of the other ones there's several different washes that they make all of those would work as well so if you're used to using those washes on your textures and things that you're doing with your pottery those will work as well and, and you can incorporate stroke and coat if you want to add colors in there as well um one other question since you only put one thin coat of stroke and coat do you need to cover with clear glaze yep and that is the last thing that i was going to talk about so you can if i'm doing a stoneware piece. Now this bowl was stoneware clay. This was a mid-range cone 5, cone 6 clay body. What I did on this one, because the clay would be vitrified when it's high fired, um, what I did is I took a seawall sponge and I just randomly dabbed clear glaze on here. So you'll see areas that are shiny and areas that are kind of dull as I turn it in the light here. If I'm working on an earthenware piece, then I would apply... Um, a couple coats of clear glaze over the top or dip it in clear glaze. I don't like dipping when I've got deep textures like the leaves because sometimes it puddles in the crevices and you get that kind of milky look on there. So I do prefer to brush. When you brush that top coat on, be careful that you don't overbrush and end up smearing the color because the color will soften every time it gets wet. technique with the other flexible stamps yourself? So that's a good question. The other flexible stamps, so there are, and I happen to have some here, these are two of the new mm -hmm. designs. Um, the flexible stamps, these will work, but what you're going to end up with is this one doesn't have a lot of extra around the outside edge, but there is a little bit. And so when you press that down in, you're going to pick up that edge, and I can actually press this in the clay here and give you an idea of what will happen. So if I press this into the clay, it will get the stamp design, but I also get a little bit of that extra edge on there. This stamp, not bad, but watch what happens with this one that has a lot more bigger areas in between the designs on here. When I press that in, there's quite a bit more area around there. And, and I don't think this looks horrible. It, it will work, but just keep in mind that you're going to have the design, and if you press harder, you're going to pick up the edge of the stamp itself, and you'll have kind of an, another area on there. So, And by the way, these are two new stamps. This one we just added on the website. This one is ST66. Um, it's called beaded round, I think. And then this one is a new holiday design. It's all ornaments going around, layers of ornaments on there. And I think this one is called 
ornament round, I think is what we named that one. This one is in stock. This one um, we haven't gotten in yet, but this will be coming soon. All right, any other questions? No, All right, I'm going to set these colors aside. I think then it is time for a mystery box. Anybody want to do a mystery box? Janine's got all the names in the bowl here, and I'm going to mix these up. Whoops. Flip them this way so they get, whoa, they're flying out of there. I need a top on the bowl. All right, now again, if we draw your name out, you need to be here. And you need to say, once we open the box, Wanda Reigns. Let us know, Wanda, if you're here. Just type in that you're here. And I'm going to open the mystery box in a minute and show you what's in that mystery box. And then if you decide that you don't want it. Sorry, there was someone who, uh, who oh. asked earlier if all of your new stuff is on the website or not. Um, I'll show the, the new items that are on the website. Those brushes are on there. Um, we've got all the new stencils. No, there's, there's new gnome stamps coming out, and those have not come in yet, so those are not up on the website. Um, all right, so Wanda, let us know again if you are here, and um, if you oh. want this box, otherwise we will draw another name. <laughs> How do I get your name in the hole? <laughs> you need to be here during the first 10 minutes, Libby, um, and then you can say mystery box, and then your name will go into the bowl. So in this box, I had said that it kind of has a lot to do with what we're doing tonight. There is a whole assortment of different stroke and coat colors. Pretty much everything that I use tonight, um, there's yellow, orange, red, purple, all the different two-ounce bottles of stroke and coat. And then there is a big assortment of the small leaf designs. You've got oak leaves, you've got maple, you've got dahlia, you've got the traditional lemon. Um, you've got the, the bigger hydrangea leaves, and the mum leaves are in this box. So, Wanda, if you um, want this box, just say yes, that you want this box. If you don't want it, we will just draw another name for that box. And while we're waiting for Wanda, I'll show you guys some of the other uh, new stuff that is on the site that just got put up. So, the, the blue texture tool... Um, I do have a piece cast, and I'm going to do just a quick live someday and just show how that's used and put it up on the website for adding textures to pieces. And then we've got all of these stencils are new. The Sunlit Forest in a 6-inch size is on the site. Um, this Peacock, the Rosetta, the Wreath with the Bow, the Christmas Tree Stencil, the Irises, the wisteria, and I can't wait to play around with this big flower. I've got some vases that I'm going to put this on, like just doing part of the flower and big bowls and plates and stuff. I'm, I'm really kind of, I think this is going to be a really cool stencil to work with. All right, so Wanda said yes to that box, so we're going to close this up. And Wanda, you can go in and pay for this box. Just go into learnfiredarts.com. I'll have Janine type the website in there. And if you see item number one under the live um, event specials, item number one is pay by the dollar amount. You just go in and enter 50 for the quantity and then follow the steps and pay for it. And it'll send us a notification with your address and we'll get that shipped out to you. If anybody else is interested in the leaves or any of the other stuff that I showed tonight, um, we've got um, all kinds of all the specials up there. We try to number everything based on what we use during the live so that... Um, you can find that easily in the um, the uh, under the the live event specials, everything that we use. So you don't have to search too much on the website, but make sure you look through too and check out all the other great stuff that's on the website as well. Is there well, a question? The blue thing was plastic or a brush. Um, so the blue thing. This is a texture tool, and this has it's on a metal rod that goes through the middle. And so this middle turns. So as you, oops, that really looked bad like I was giving everybody the finger, but it was my index finger. So as you roll that across the wear, the middle doesn't turn. You can hold that steady and the, the ball end rolls. And there's two different ends. They have the same texture, but they're designed to get into tighter areas with the one side. This one is for, for bigger areas. So it's a very hard, durable plastic. And the, the part in the middle that slides is a, it looks like brass. It's a, a metal, very, very durable tool. 
So those will be in soon. They're expected sometime this month. We should have those in stock and ready to ship. I know we have hundreds and hundreds of orders for them um, right now, and those will be shipping out as soon as those come in. Some people were ordering other stuff and those tools. We're shipping everything else out, and then the tools will ship when those come in if you've got an order that has other items on it. So, all right, I don't see any other questions. All right, well, thanks, you guys, for joining us tonight. We'll be back in two weeks, and we're going to try to keep this at 6.30 um, so that it doesn't overlap with Jessica's stuff. Um, so I uh, look forward to seeing you in a, in a couple weeks. And, oh, did something come up? Is it brush or plastic? <laughs> Is it brush or plastic? It's not really a brush. It's not a brush. It's, it's a, a texture, texture tool for adding texture back into the clay. Clay Magic has a lot of bears and bunnies and things with this bumpy texture, and that's really what it's designed for is putting texture back in. It's not for painting. You, I don't. If I put paint on this, it would just make a mess, I think. So, yeah, sorry if you were confused on what that was for, but it's, it's for adding texture back into pieces. So, all right, I, yep, and I will see if any of you in, in Florida and Alabama area, we've got workshops coming up in a couple weeks. I'll be down there teaching. There's still room in some of those workshops. Check those out on the website, too. We've got those under the event specials. Um, so I look forward to seeing you guys in a couple weeks, whether it's in, oh, you know what? I don't know if I'm back in, is yeah. two weeks Two weeks is the, today's the 14th, so the 20th. Okay, so yes, I will be back in two weeks, and then there there will be, I'm gone for about 10 days, and I have to look at how those Wednesdays fall in there. I think there might be one where I'm not going to be live. Don't be mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> this is my life. All right, so thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we will see you guys later. Take care.